But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means at our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss how leaders and their decisions shape the world we live in today. Welcome to episode six of the History in Motion podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about Neville Chamberlain. Is he the poster boy of appeasement? It's easy to throw judgments from the present onto the past. Ultimately, we know the policy of, of appeasement failed and is argued to be one of the leading causes for World War II. However, is it a fair judgment to characterize Neville Chamberlain by his by this one failure, considering that the memory of World War I was very recent, the impact of which was still being felt? We'll be discussing Chamberlain's legacy and the impact appeasement had on it. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Uh, we are we are here with, I think this is episode five, with where we're going to do things a little bit different. And I think, Richie, when we were kind of talking offline and you had a good idea of, you know, we talked about some interesting leaders and how these leaders that we looked at always kind of been looked at in a very positive light or a very grandiose light um, mm-hmm. with history. But you had a good idea and you said, why don't we maybe turn the tables a little bit and, and look at someone who maybe history isn't too kind to. And, and that, I guess, you know, maybe if you want to introduce who we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So I actually got the idea. I don't, I don't know what movie I was watching, but it was so random. I was like, bad decisions. Let's focus on bad decisions. <laughs> And for some reason, I immediately went to Neville Chamberlain, um, quote unquote, poster boy for appeasement as um, his decision to appease Hitler, to give over the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, which essentially, you know, opened up the arena that would eventually lead to World War II. And that's kind of, you know, the decision I think that we're going to be looking at today. A little bit of post-historical analysis, obviously, with World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, and how, you know, many historians think, like, the seeds of World War II were pretty much set, you know, when the treaty was signed. And how, Mm. I don't like the word inevitable, but based on what I know and what I read as a history student, most historians thought, you know, it was pretty inevitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe not to the level of what happened, and it, it took a, a certain psychopath to to get yes. in charge to make it to what it was. But I think I would agree with you on that one. I think, you know, when we kind of started this podcast, right, we were looking at decisions and, and wanted to kind of, you know, do our own analysis a little bit. But I think this will be a good one because, you know, coming into this, I think in maybe popular culture is, you know, Neville Chamberlain, bad, Lo- you know, gave Hitler what he wanted, Churchill, good, de- defeated Hitler. And it's obviously a very simplistic way. And I think this will be a, an interesting kind of way to see it was, was Chamberlain as bad as everybody says, or is, is there something more to it? So yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it and maybe just start off with where you kind of spoke on a little bit already on the Treaty of Versailles um, and the legacy of, of World War I. So I think that the big thing here is, and I was kind of thinking about this earlier of, you know, if you just started learning history for the first time and you learned about World War I, you'd be like, okay, Western Front. Britain, France, America, Canada, the colonies against Germany. Okay, we got that war ended. World War Two, surely, you know, you know, who who is going to be in that battle? Is it, you know, is it going to be some some different folks or? Oh, no, it's exactly the same people fighting, you know, in (laughs) maybe not exactly the same spots, but pretty darn close. So I think your point of, you know, it, maybe it was almost like a pause to to a war, then maybe Mm -hmm. two separate wars. But what really happened at the end of World War One was the German army kind of was at a point where they had kind of had enough. They were there were some internal disputes going back back home with the government, um, and basically, it kind of got to a point where they, I guess, like the word mutiny comes up. Not sure if that's really the best way to describe it, but there was kind of a collapse of the German army, and the Allied powers were were able to win. And then, so what happened after that was they needed to sign a peace treaty. And so that's where the Treaty of Versailles comes in. And the French during this time had basically gone bankrupt from the war. They had lost 
millions of people due to the war itself, whether it be civilians, um, direct casualties from battle, disease, all those sort of things. And they had this deep, deep hatred for everything that Germany had done. Um, and we have to remember, too, Germany was allied with the with Austria, Austria-Hungary, who actually were the first to declare war on Serbia, which kind of kickstarted everything, and which makes this next point super interesting to me. Um, it was kind of France and the Western powers, but mostly kind of this came from France, was like they wanted to really stick it to Germany. They wanted them to pay mass amount of reparations, but ultimately they wanted Germany to admit fault for this war. And so there's a there's a quote actually in the Treaty of Versailles called the War Guilt Clause. And it says, quote, the allied and associated governments affirm and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the damage, all the loss and damage to which the allied and associated governments and their nationals have been subjected to as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. Damn. Yeah. It's so, and like the fact that it's Germany and her allies, you know, the Ottoman empire, they, they did a lot of nasty stuff. We have Mm -hmm. the Austria Hungary empire, you know, to, to just stick it all on Germany is, is really a slap in the face. I think to, to Germany in the sense of like, this is your fault and you're going to have to pay for it. And it's an interesting sentiment though, right? Like this, like, if you think about it, and we, this is a little bit of foresight, and you think about the nationalism that eventually took hold of Germany, largely perpetuated by Hitler and the Nazi party, a direct response to this type of guilt. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's very interesting. Yeah, like to be to be labeled, you know, here's 40 million deaths of an entire war are all Mm -hmm. your fault yeah you know and you can i'm sure you can break down the beginnings of world war one and there's a million different reasons about who who to blame who for what but to put it all on germany i think you're right it opens up this vacuum for a charismatic leader to come in when the people are most vulnerable Mm -hmm. and i think this is a great starting point but then also what the french do in declaring all of these reparations is germany doesn't have them they've just gone through a war too they don't got mountains of gold that they're sitting on that they can just pay France. So they have to print a ton of money and then the great depression hits. And so it's like a double whammy of hyperinflation, no jobs, mm-hmm. this huge vacuum um, that's opened up and really paves the way for someone like Hitler to come in. And I was telling you this offline, Richie, and it's still, I can't believe it's true is that Germany was still paying France reparation payments until October 3rd of 2010. Like I looked it up and it was like an ABC News article. That's how recent it was saying. Like, That's actually ABC. so hard com. to believe. 2010. Yeah. It's nuts. It's and you think about crazy. it too, for the French, right? You think this is Germany is your ally for decades now at this point. You think you might want to do them a favor or figure out something that can go on. Hey, like, forget about it. You can only imagine what the, <laughs> what the interest on a, a million dollars is over 98 years or whatever it ended up being. But This is the point, right? Like this to just kind of shows the scale of what the reparations were that it took them 90 plus years to, to pay it off. And there's this great quote that I think wraps up this kind of piece on the Treaty of Versailles perfectly from a a historian whose name I, I don't have written down, but I think this is a perfect way of looking at it. So it being the Treaty of Versailles was neither lenient enough to appease Germany nor harsh enough to prevent it from becoming a dominant continental power again. So it really, it embarrassed them but it really didn't stop them from doing anything. So it really accomplished other than pissing off Germany. What what did it really do? That's an interesting take, right? And I think it kind of goes back to that point about, again, I'm not a big fan of the word inevitable, but planting (laughs) those seeds of world war two, that this conflict was, you know, essentially going to happen again. The, the theaters would be different. the, 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 The tactics would be different, but ultimately you know those the punishment put towards germany was going to result in some sort of conflict in the future for sure and it's you can even see it right we talked about it with um with harry truman and and what happened with japan right it was this is america parking their butts in in japan for years and and putting very harsh sanctions on them so they you know their economy can grow but they'll never be able to wage war again and that's what they did and so I think it's a there's a direct you know lessons learned for a 
you know, a modern kind of business kind of lingo is, yeah, here's our lessons learned, but what a lesson it ended up being. And yeah. I think that, you know, it, go, it goes into, you know, not just that like Germany's, you know, in this state of just embarrassment and financial ruin is this social stigma and trauma that's been put onto Europe by World War One is something that's never been seen. This is the first type of war where photography, video, are actually like available for people to see of like the horrors of, of actually what happened. And it brings out horrible weapons of tanks, bombers, artillery at a scale that was never seen before, poison gas, um, to a, again, to a level that was never been seen before. And then on top of that, it was the first war where civilians really felt under threat in a way that they never have before. Like you could say back in like the medieval era or, or any era where you had more like cities with walls around it and they were under siege but you kind of anticipated that like hey we're gonna be under siege we under we understand what's coming versus you're in your home every night you don't know when that bomber is gonna roll over your town it could be tomorrow it could be a week from now it could never happen and so that psychological warfare that's hitting up the civilians is something that was really never seen before so this is this social level of anxiety now that exists across all of europe that is going to be in the back of everybody's mind and we have to kind of remember when Hitler's kind of rising to power and becoming more militaristic. It's only been 20 years. Like it's not a long time. Like pretty much everybody who's alive remembers this war and, and how devastating. It's in very was. recent memory. Yeah. Very, very recent memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a quote here from Stanley Baldwin who ended up becoming one of the prime ministers um, of Britain. I believe he was before um, Chamberlain and he basically had this speech to the house of commons and he said, the bomber will always get through. And he was kind of alluding to when there's another war, there's going to be bomb. There'll be at least one bomber that's going to get through into our cities and is going to level a you know a block, going to level a factory, and we're going to lose civilians as a result. So they knew that this air war was coming, and boy, did it ever come! Um, but this is just one of those things where civilians are always going to be at threat, and mm -hmm. the, they're just nobody's ready for to deal with this. And and there's this the public pressure and the politics, like nobody wants another war. But then there's like a double whammy that kind of happens. And this is something I, I kind of knew, but I was looking up a little bit more was the Spanish flu hits in 1918. So right at the last year of, of World War One. So it kind of starts around the end of World War One, um, and then ends kind of around 1920, depending on some sources. But the crazy thing is, is 2.5 million people died from the Spanish flu in 1918 in Europe alone. So you have to remember, there's millions of people dying in this war, and now you've got this disease that's, you know, ravaging the the whole world. It's just people are tired, right? They're just like, is this been a global so much pandemic death. that we're talking yes. about? Oh this my is god, this is a global a global pandemic. That's how we bring it back around on wow. this podcast. Yeah, and an even crazier number that I saw, just kind of quick factoid here, was the Spanish flu killed more people than World War One did, which. Just puts into perspective the amount of death that the world faced in five, six years. So, like I said, people are tired. People just want to live their lives. And I think that's kind of why you see the Roaring Twenties come through, right? Like, people are just living their best life the way they can, and then it, it comes crashing down um, really yeah, hard. Yeah, so this Really <laughs> does. crashing and, down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, so with that, you know, all this death and destruction, just, you know, pacifism and disarmament of, of militaries is so popular and just nobody wants to even think about war. Um, and if things are going well, like why would you think about war? Um, but when you're in Germany or in some of these other countries where your economy is in the toilet, you know, war starts to become a, you know, a profitable and potentially nation building um, or galvanizing sort of movement. So yeah, like I said, we're at this point, world war one, the Spanish flu, nobody wants to think about war. And, and there's just that hesitancy of, can we avoid war at all costs? Mm -hmm. Which which brings us to kind of Hitler rising to power. And, and I think that's an interesting story for another day. But I think the, the key piece here is how the rest of Europe saw Hitler. So, so we all know who Hitler is and his, you know, enemy number one when we talk about terrible people in the history of the world. But, you know, in the before 1938, 1937, he wasn't that bad of a guy as, as how the world would look at him. It's like, yeah, he's a little expansionist. He's being a little bit militaristic. We probably have to keep an eye on the guy, but what do we have to worry about, right? Um, so there was a common up, kind of slogan that was thrown around like upper-class British society where they said, better Hitlerism than communism. 
So this is where we start to see the first of like a true red scare coming through Britain um, and the West. And then even this is an even crazier quote. In 1937, Lord Halifax, who was a close supporter of Chamberlain, and then they kind of fell out um, later in Chamberlain's career. He said, nationalism and radicalism is a powerful force, but I can't feel that it's either unnatural or immoral. I cannot myself doubt that these fellows are genuine haters of communism. And I dare say if I were, if we were in their position, we might feel the same in regards to Nazi Germany. This is 1937 too, right? Dude, come on. Like, that's crazy to me to hear that. That early in the game, you know what I mean? This whole yeah. Nazism versus communism sentiment. And again, this is another conversation we talked, we had offline, but this is something that really um, sustained itself over the duration of the of the war and post-war the mm-hmm. sentiment of like well at least they're not communists <laughs> yeah and in, and i can and like you you can look at it and be like yeah communism for what it did to europe and into asia for and all the deaths it has on its hands but again there's a level to your enemy the enemy of my enemy is my friend but even the co- communism isn't even your enemy at this point it's yeah, no. we don't agree with them we should probably yeah. be careful and and make sure it doesn't get over here but like to the point where you would support you know a nazi regime and, and all the and especially with world war 2 sorry world war 1 being not even 20 years at this point you know you you're at the point where you had this deep hatred for germany and you're willing to kind of bring them into the fold again just because they're not communists it's i think it's maybe a little bit of that British upper class society, maybe kind of being like democracy and capitalism is the way to go, which is again, still kind of a new concept at the time Mm -hmm. um, and wanting to defend that, you know, at all costs and saw communism as a very populist, you know, masses rising up sort of movement and a real threat to, you know, this high society life that they kind of established for themselves, especially if you're named Lord Halifax too. Yeah. (laughs) Like yeah, Lord Halifax, come on. Right. So things do change, though. Um, so we'll get into this a little bit, I think. So this happens two months after the Munich Agreement, and that's Kristallnacht. And this is the big turning point for people maybe would be a little bit more hesitant to say Hitlerism is better than communism. So Kristallnacht, for those who don't know, it means Night of the Broken Glass and is the first of the major violent acts against the Jewish population in Germany. So it's called the Night of the Broken Glass because a lot of Jewish businesses, homes, synagogues, other places of worship, um, windows, basically windows are broken, burned, things like that. Um, and so if you walk the streets, there'd just be broken glass everywhere. And so it was just this horrible racial violence that swept across the whole country all in one night. Um, and so this news gets back to Britain and the masses starts to change their tune a little bit. The British newspapers and, and the media start to start talking about this as, okay, there's something bad going on here. And we, you know, I don't think we can really talk in the terms of Hitler's not that bad of a guy or he's just, you know, you know, don't worry, let the let kind of the Germans, you know, do what they need to do. It, it's a it's a big piece and I think really changes the way the British government, and the British people look at at the Nazi regime at this point, which kind of brings us back to, you know, we see the British politics and kind of British masses. But there's a level two of within British and Western society of self-determination so that was kind of something i believe woodrow wilson kind of brought up and it was you know the people should have the ability to self-determine kind of who governs them um and so people were kind of looking at these minority german communities that were stripped away from germany in the treaty of versailles or part of other countries saying like well look they're like we did we did the we didn't do the germans the the best at uh, at the end of world war one can we give them a you know a little bit of a break here can people who are minorities um, in these communities who are minority German, can they get back with Germany? So they're part of the majority again. And people were kind of, you know, open to that, but, and so that's where I think you could see, well, we'll get into the Munich agreement, why there was a little bit of that. All right. Yeah. Give, give Hitler a little bit of this. If he wants to take back some of the land he lost in in the treaty of Versailles, we get it because we got to, you want to unite, you know, all people who speak German, but there's another kind of piece too of, of Churchill who kind of comes into this and Churchill didn't become he wasn't prime minister at the beginning of world war one that was still or sorry world war two that was um still neville chamberlain but he kind of always had this anti-german kind of warning of the dangers of german rearmament um you know for it's which is interesting right because he was so anti-communist of all people um but still kind of 
was able to see the the dangers of the Nazi regime. And it was kind of a hope from a lot of people within the British public and politics that there would just be a war between Hitler and Stalin and everyone could sit back and watch them destroy each other. And that would just mm-hmm. make the West stronger. But little, little did they know what was on the horizon. But, you know, Churchill had some some ideas too, where he like was really pushing to expand the Navy and the Air Force, where Chamberlain mm-hmm. wanted to build an expeditionary force, which was very like unpopular at the time because the thought of like conscript doing conscription again and taking you know mother's sons away from from their families to go fight in a war you know was a little bit was much harder to swallow than you know we're going to build a large air force and and kind of send those planes away but you know there's some people have argued that like you know churchill he he comes off with like hey he had all these great ideas but part of it was was it just doing the opposite of what Chamberlain wanted so he could <laughs> kind of take power. Um, talking about building up the Air Force was probably a cheaper option than than building out a, a million person army versus it sounds like politics though, no? Just saying the opposite of whatever your but your you know your counterpart saying. <laughs> exactly. It's a it's as old as time, right? And so I think maybe Richie, this is a good point where we before we kind of get into a little bit of this Chamberlain Churchill rivalry and kind of some of the political choices Chamberlain made. I think I think we need to get to know him a little bit more as a person and, and how we got to this point of being Prime Minister of England at this time. Yeah, for sure. And I think we'll definitely touch back on the relationship between him and Chamberlain. And uh, there's a few great quotes um, that were exchanged between the two that we'll get to. But yeah. Oh, uh, I cannot wait. Cannot wait. We'll we'll pivot to, to Neville Chamberlain, Arthur Neville Chamberlain. And it's his full name. He was born March 18th. Uh, 1869 in Birmingham into a pretty wealthy, politically active family. Uh, his father was involved in politics and served as a cabinet minister during Queen Victoria's uh, uh, reign. He was married twice and had a handful of children. <clears throat> uh, much to do in this era. His sons were responsible for upholding the trade and traditions of the family. Um, his older brother actually was the first one again to politics, Austin Chamberlain, his older half brother. He had a, a number of civil and political posts. He was a foreign secretary and actually earned a Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, the family is coming from, wow, has some merit. You know what I mean? They have some credibility. They they have they have pedigree in, in you know, in the upper echelons of English society and in the political realm at that time. And I think at that time, too, this that's so important, especially in, in British society, right? Like, you know, this this higher class. And I actually read somewhere it was I think it was Austin Chamberlain. The father kind of always pegged him as to be the. Yep, the prime minister right. one day, and and Neville will kind of be in the business guy, which is it's just funny to see kind of where life, you know, takes people. But anyways, I think that was no, yeah. an interesting tidbit of what what a father kind of plans out for his his family that he's got set up with everything you could possibly need to be successful in life, and and kind of how that doesn't always come to pass. Well, it's funny how that works, right? So like Neville in his early adulthood, you know, again to your point, while he was kind of directed to focus on business first. Um, he was quite an in- introverted uh, young man, apparently, according to history books. Um, I guess introversion wasn't too fairly looked upon back in the day. Uh, <laughs> so he was bullied quite a lot during his time attending two universities. One was Mason College and the other was the rugby school in England. Um, after he finished school, he actually went to manage a plantation in the Bahamas. Ultimately, this venture would fail. But I think as like, personally speaking... This was a good time for him because I think he was able to kind of, uh, you know, move away from the sphere of his family, get some leadership skills, get some life skills and get out of, you know, that kind of world that he had been so deeply entrenched in. But when he comes home, this is when, you know, he goes into business, but for a little bit, but then ultimately turns into turns to politics. And when we kind of see a bit of a a meteoric almost Truman-esque rise if you've been listening to our previous episodes. <laughs> um, you know, he so in 1911, he joins the Birmingham City Council. That's his first position. Uh, in 1915, he becomes Lord Mayor of Birmingham. At 49, he's too old to serve in World War One, but he did serve as the Director of National Service. He was appointed by Lloyd George. Um, he was in charge of compulsion, which, uh, Paul, you had mentioned earlier, is really conscription, those expeditionary forces that he was trying to build out. Not very effective. A lot of pushback <laughs> from the PM and the unions. Uh, in 1918, he was elected to the House of Commons within the Conservative Party. He became the Postmaster General in 1922, uh, Minister of Health a few months later. He became the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, after that within five years. 
So apparently that position, the chancellor is kind of like the secretary in charge of the economy. While he is in this position, um, he, you know, he kind of breaks away with conservative tradition in, in many ways. Um, you know, he, in 1929, he reforms the poor law, which essentially lays the foundation foundation of the welfare state. And, um, he also looks at the import duties bill in 1932. So this is essentially following the wall street crash, you know, the roaring twenties coming to a crashing yep. halt, uh, to ensure that the economy is kind of stable. Uh, in 1937, uh, he's elected the leader of the conservative party. Um, following that he, he passes the factories act, which is you know quite progressive, which really <laughs> says how many, he limits the hours of work <laughs> for children and women within factories. Wow. Uh, 1938, he passes the Holiday Act with pay. So essentially, you could take a vacation for a week and get paid for it. Very novel concept at this time. So essentially, you know, this shy boy from rugby school who was introverted and picked on and, you know, didn't do too well in business, turns into the leader of the Conservative Party and eventually the PM who kind of broke away from this very harsh conservative tradition of putting work before social needs, right? It's not something that we typically see or associate with the conservative party, at least in the modern era. Yeah. And I think if you look just at his kind of list of accomplishments here and didn't tell me what party he'd been, be like, oh, he's a labor guy. Like hundred percent. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's just kind of interesting how, how things change. And the fact that he passed all these things and still was able to lead the party, I think is really interesting. Like he's not the radical in the party who's just going against you know what the leadership wants there's something truly you know how you know how i would love to have kind of seen how he argues you know some of these some of these bills and how he got them pushed through um in the way he did because you're right like if we looked at this today like there's no way you know a conservative slash more business focused party would would agree to some of these very liberal and kind of new age ideas yeah yeah protecting the people right like the individual from corporate and industrial greed which you know again not something we associate with the any modern conservative party at least you know in, in my mind yeah so from here i think like it might be a good pivot point to start talking about not t entirely jumping into you know the conversation of appeasement but maybe painting a bit of a you know portrait of the context around how this decision ultimately you know came into being and what kind of led to it um, so it's the Sudetenland crisis, which is a region in Czechoslovakia, border Germany. And Paul, you touched on it earlier about this idea of like self-directed governance, you know, amongst people. We're talking about 3 million ethnic German speakers in this region. There's even a Sudeten German People's Party. They're pushing for, they're pushing for annexation for, uh, you know, for, for alignment with Germany. Obviously, from the German perspective, I think their aims were a bit more materialistic. They have coal mines. They're heavily defended. Uh, one of the largest manufacturers of armaments is also kind of, you know, strategically poised in this area, Skoda. Very convenient. Very convenient. <laughs> very, very convenient. Um, also very convenient. Hermann Goring is also a major shareholder of Skoda at the time. So that's an interesting factoid for any amateur historians. <laughs> Um, in 1938, so there's this guy named Heinlein, who is essentially the leader of the student and German People's Party. Um, I think through unofficial channels, <laughs> he is asked by the Nazi party to stir up some trouble. Uh, Prague had unions with French and Soviet influence. So essentially, they wanted to create some drama and conflict to essentially trigger a reason for intervention within the Sudetenland to give kind of Germany the, the opportunity to say, Hey, we're actually here to save our people. Again, it's, it's, I think we've touched upon this before. Look at what's going on in the Ukraine today, mm -hmm. right? Oh, we yeah. have Russian, we have ethnic <laughs> Russians in parts of the Ukraine that are in danger that we need to kind of go in there, annex and save. Like I think the more you study history, the more you see these patterns, right? It's it's almost like Putin pulled out a playbook and just said, oh, "What did what did we do? What what happened in the in thirty eight? Yeah, let's just do that. <laughs> let's do that again. Hey, you even think like, yeah, we're trying to denazify Ukraine. We need to save Ukraine from all the terrible things that are going on there in Russia. You control the media and all these sort of things, which 
you know, Hitler had Goebbels, so you absolutely knew that we need to save the people of the Sudetenland. Your your fellow Germans are being killed or whatever, whatever nonsense I'm sure they were throwing out. It's 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 scary just how similar and just almost how simplistic it seems when you kind of look when you take a step back and look at it like yeah it's wild this is something that always kind of blows my mind when i'm studying history is just the consistent patterns that you see you know we're we're talking almost a century ago more or less you know plus or minus 10 years but Mm -hmm. like same playbook um but from there we can kind of jump into the conversations that would lead up to the official decision of appeasement. So we're talking about the conversations that would lead to the Munich Agreement. So a a series of discussions that happen over September 1938. The first conversation happens early in September. Hitler asked for the Sudetenland. Chamberlain was able to actually get agreement uh, for this without any check consultation, but was successful. You'll notice this is a theme in, in some of these discussions. We have some very interesting parties that are absent. Czechoslovakia being, you know, the main one. <laughs> uh, in September twenty, uh, September twenty second, nineteen thirty eight, I was reading that you know, since Hitler actually didn't think very highly of Chamberlain, he pretty much during this conversation asked for the total dissolution of Czechoslovakia, <laughs> with a whole new set of demands that came out of nowhere. Uh, which wow. were, you know, to Chamberlain's credit, rejected by uh, by Chamberlain and the French president. And then in late September in Munich, you have Germany, France, Great Britain, and Italy. Notable mentions. We got the Czechs missing, and we have the Soviet <laughs> Union missing, uh, where they come to an agreement and where uh, Great Britain and France pretty much tell the Czechs, you know, if you disagree with this, you're pretty much shit out of luck and you're on your own to defend yourself against Germany. And this is kind of the crowning moment for the policy of appeasement. And October 1st, 1938, Germany occupies the Sudetenland. I just can't get past the fact that the Czechs just are like left out of it. It's like, yeah, because like, I think we both kind of were reading into this a bit too on like how the Czechs after World War One were like, well, we should build up some fortresses and military kind of defenses along our German Czech border to if you know, Germany ever acts up again, we have some protection. But naturally, those are all in the Sudetenland. So if you give that land away, you really don't have any anything else to do when, when Germany decides that, hey, you know, the rest of Czechoslovakia is looking really nice or, or other countries in the area are trying to get a piece of any areas where they've had border disputes with. But my goodness, to just not invite the Czechs at all and just be like, yeah, here you go, hand it over or you're on your own is... It's just interesting too, just even the way like the demographics of Central Europe work on how even some of these countries come to be with these massive powers around them and how they're just not oh, yeah. gobbled up. And it kind of, you see it happen here, but yeah, I it's a theme, I guess, of throughout history is the big powers make the decisions and the little ones are just have to sit there. It's and like who writes history, the losers or the winners, right? Like it's that yeah. kind of uh, old trope. But like on that point, so I went pretty deep here because as one does. Um, that's so what, Germany, that's what we do here. Yeah, that's what we do here. Uh, Germany wasn't actually ready for a full mechanization of their land forces in the fall of 1938. And Czechoslovakia at the time had a pretty well-trained military, according to the history books. So it's it's tough to say like what actually would have happened if Germany would have just invaded by force rather than just kind of giving up the Sudetenland via a treaty or like, you know, a formal policy documentation being signed. It's also reported that at the time, the chief, the army chief of staff for Germany had a, uh, how should I put it, didn't really like Hitler to the point where (laughs) it was like so well known that he actually wanted to kill him and would carry around a pistol ready to kind of kill Hitler if the opportunity presented itself. So we're talking about, you know, there's a, there's still a lot of unknowns, a lot of instability potentially in the inwards, in the inner circle, sorry, of like, you know, the German government, the military factions, Hitler's rise to power. This isn't like a consolidated Germany that, you know, is looking at at Hitler as this kind of central piece of the puzzle just yet. I think that's a good point, right? Because like you have to remember, 
there is a big communist movement that existed in in Germany. There was a bunch of other political parties that Hitler eventually banned and, and kind of took over the country. But like those people don't just disappear. They may, you know, wave their Nazi flag and and give Hitler the salute when he drives by. But but deep down, they have some resentment and, and wishing for the old days or a different um, day. And I think we have to think too, like how the war starts for Germany when they do start invading some of these countries where they essentially steamroll everybody that they yep. they get everything they want. Could you imagine like an attack on the Czechs if it did happen and they're not really mobilized to the level they were in 1939 into 1940 and they get bogged down in a tough war with the Czechs. You know, Hitler's power is not consolidated in the way that it would be in, you know, 1940. You know, maybe that guy who's carrying the pistol around maybe thinks about it a little bit more when he sees his men dying or the public kind of goes, all right, Hitler, like, you got our economy back. You've you've kind of told France, you know, to, to where to go. Is this really necessary? And and maybe things would have changed. And I think that's a great point of, you know, they weren't really ready and just almost forcing Hitler's hand a little bit more would have been an interesting kind of alternative history. Well, this is a great point. So um, apparently the German high command was totally aware of their relative weakness and they didn't want war. They didn't even want war with the Czechs because they thought the Czechs would be a formidable enemy, which you got to ask yourself, did Chamberlain know any or all of this? And according to, you know, some of our research, apparently he did. He did have intelligence reports kind of giving him insight into what was going on, you know, within the German high command, yet he still appeased him. And I think, you know, this is kind of the crux of our discussion is, would this change the course of, of history if he would have kind of taken that intelligence report more seriously and not appease Hitler knowing what apparently the intelligence reports were telling him, which is Germany is not ready for war. They're, you know, ultimately kind of bluffing here. So there's actually no need to give it. Right. And I think it's a theme, right? Like nobody's really ready for war. The French aren't ready. The Ger the, the English aren't ready. Like they still have their, they're still running around with, you know, like, I've kind of heard a quote of they needed to militarize, like motorize their armies because like still relying on horseback and, and stuff like that from World War One. So yeah, I was like, anybody really ready? And I guess it was like, who was who was somewhat more ready? And I've heard the argument, too, that the French kind of they would, the French had good land forces. They had a lot more tanks than the Germans, a lot more artillery. Um, and the British had more planes and, and more and a larger navy. And so there was kind of this, hey, you know, France, you deal. You got a land border to deal with we'll take the sea in the air. And then even on the East. And I think before we kind of get into the decision a little bit more, this was something I found that was interesting was the Soviets had some sort of agreement in place with the Czechs that if they were attacked, they would step in, but they kind of made it clear that we're only going to do it. If France kind of fires the first shot or moves first, if France moves, we'll back you up. Mm -hmm. And so Chamberlain had this opportunity here to build some alliances with these countries around Germany. And it kind of goes back to like, what set off World War One was a lot of people thought like all of these different alliances just kind of like a domino effect. And so people are a little bit worried about building alliances. But again, this distrust of the Soviets, for some reason, Chamberlain didn't trust Stalin, which again, in hindsight, fair decision. We saw what happened to the Japanese, but he distrusted him more than he distrusted Hitler, which I think is the big mistake. And there's a quote from from Chamberlain here, he said, I must confess to the most profound distrust of Russia. I have no belief what, whatever in her ability to maintain an effective offensive, even if she wanted to. And I distrust her motives, which seem to, to have little connection with our ideas of liberty. Hmm. Not wrong on the motives, but definitely dead wrong on the ability to maintain an effective offensive once they got into high gear. Yeah. And so actually Chamberlain in the, so not Chamberlain, sorry, the English and the French meet with the Soviets for a meeting. And it was like, I believe the French and the British sent like some admirals who like didn't really have much power. And then the Soviets sent like someone who was pretty senior who actually had some power to talk about like what we're going to do with the Czechs. And they all agreed like, hey, like we should kind of slow Hitler down here. And then the talks just fell apart right away when um, they started talking about like, oh, we should move troops here or there. And there's a letter from Chamberlain to his sister and basically explains like he's kind of happy that talks are breaking down. He's like, it's good. Like we don't have to deal with these Soviets and, and communism and all of its terrible things. And we can just put them aside. 
yet he just doesn't realize that there's this perfect opportunity right here. Like if you were to go to Hitler and say France, Britain, and the Soviet Union say you cannot touch the Czech Republic, I think that changes things, right? Because again, if Germany's not ready for war and now they have a two front war to deal with, which is the main reason they never, you know, they didn't attack the Soviet Union until I think it was 1941. Much um, later. Yeah. Yeah. Much later than when they moved into Poland and they even split Poland with the Soviets and had the non-aggression pact. So yeah, I think we have to look at kind of Chamberlain here seeing like, you know, what was, what was the war readiness kind of piece for Germany and the rest of Europe and like his inability to, to build some alliances and, and really bring the hammer down on Germany. Cause it, Germany outside of really Italy and even Italy was kind of teetering on the edge of being a former ally or not. Yep. They really could have, kind of swallowed Hitler up and said, you have enemies at all sides and, you know, your move, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, history is funny that way, right? In terms of like those kind of decisions. It's funny because he obviously had some foresight. He's obviously a very smart guy. He's able to, you know, work his way through the the political echelons of, of Great Britain all the way to prime minister. And then still to have that kind of what I would call a short-sighted perspective when it comes to Russia is quite sad because it could have been one of those game-changing decisions at the end of the day that could have stopped, you know, one of the worst wars and atrocities that, you know, we've ever seen or documented in the history of the world. And essentially opening up the floodgates for communism, the big fear, right, to just... yeah roll through Eastern and Central Europe and cause havoc for 50 to 60 years uh, on a really massive level. Um, I guess and it's weird that they were even kind of at the point where they're like, oh, let's just see Hitler and the Russians go at it. They kind of expected a stalemate. And I, it's just, again, short-sightedness when you look at the size of Russia and the power that it has and the ability to mobilize and the way they kind of treat the people there and can almost have... They almost had some level of slavery there. Actually, yep. I guess they did have slavery with the cold gulag system and stuff where like they could scale things up pretty quickly if they wanted to. So I, I think that's, there's, I guess, two pieces now that we're talking through it on, on this decision. There's the the preemptive buildup of alliances and, and understanding where Germany's at versus like, you know, was appeasement just giving Hitler what he wanted because he was weak. I think those are two different things. And I think, I think maybe this is a good point, Richie, where we can maybe talk about like appeasement itself. And, you know, was he just being weak or was there maybe some sort of precedent here, you know, that we, that maybe kind of defends Chamberlain here a little bit or gives him a little bit of leeway? Yeah. So that's a great pivot point. I, so I'll be totally transparent before I jumped into doing this research. And even when I kind of posed the question to you, Paul, about looking at a kind of net negative decision as an episode uh, topic. I had an opinion on Chamberlain and appeasement, which was he shouldn't have done it, yada, 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 based on what I had known at the time. And kind of going back and asking myself, it was it the right decision? Well, I think in hindsight, you know, we, we have the luxury of looking back and saying no. But if we, you know, try our best to go back to that particular context, that particular decision, you got to think, you know, were, was anyone ready for full scale war? French and the British? No, Germany wasn't even ready, depending on, you know, how early we're talking. And you can even see in, in, in some of the, the research that I did, like Chamberlain foresaw the threat of aerial threats and civilian casualties. There's a quote from uh, when he's flying back from Munich. He remarked how easily it would be to bomb London. Which kind of gives you the chills, right? Knowing what we know now about like mm -hmm. the carpet bombing that would happen across different theaters of war. Mm -hmm. Civilian casualties and civilian bombings became the norm during World War II. So yeah. here is this guy who makes this decision, but also sees like, you know, with a level of foresight is able to kind of see that these new tactics of war are really going to danger the civilian population. And it's, yeah, it's a kind of a scary thought, you know, you're just looking out the window going, if I had a bomb here, like, God, this is easy. You just have to drop it and I could hit anything. And I think we even saw that when we looked at, when we talked about Truman and, you know, the atomic bomb and we, but we talked about the strategic bombing campaigns on both sides and just yep. the level of devastation being unprecedented. And I, like 
there's no way Chamberlain could have foresaw, you know, the strategic bombing campaigns, but also like the V1s and the V2s coming across the channel every single day. Again, this was a, there's, there's a level of foresight, but like there's to just imagine the level of destruction. The actual scale of it, it right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I just, I don't know if he, he, maybe he did see something like that, but just, it is, it is interesting how once kind of planes were used and aircraft were used for the first time in war, everyone kind of opened their eyes and said, this is a new era. This is, you know, the, the time of massive armies meeting in open combat. Those those days are long gone. Yep. Yep. And I think that it, I think on, on this particular point, so I think we often hold, you know, this, this sentiment that Neville Chamberlain is kind of synonymous with this idea of appeasement. So I asked myself, how accurate is this in totality? You have this guy, you know, if we're looking at his political decision-making, kind of broke away from tradition in many respects as the, as the leader of the Conservative Party. But in this respect, when it comes to appeasement, he's not really breaking away from tradition. He's kind of holding the status quo, right? Like this wasn't just the first decision of appeasement that was happening in you know a post world war one world there are several examples of appeasement happening you know throughout that period leading up to this particular decision and there's a list that i put together so you have the japanese invasion of manchuria league of nations didn't do anything because they didn't want to risk you know a trade war with japan you have the failed uh attempt to take over austria by the germans uh, that was only kind of intervened by Mussolini, uh, ironically, who stopped it. Uh, Italy evading Ethiopia. It was because of a border incident. Again, the British sentiment was to not intervene. Hitler retaking the Rhineland. Meant to stay demilitarized as a part of the Treaty of Versailles. They were so... Un- like This is a cool factoid that I, I think we were talking about offline. Mm-hmm. So when the German forces entered the Rhineland... They went in with the orders that if anyone opposed them, they were to retreat immediately. They were not ready for any kind of engagement wow. on the battlefield. Nuts. That's that's the ultimate bluff right there, right? It's like, let's see what level, the, like how much I can take. Like, And again, they get, you give Hitler an inch, he's going to go, oh, I can take the Rhineland. Oh, I can take the exactly. Sudeten. Oh, you let me take the Sudetenland. I can take all of Czechoslovakia. Oh, like you let me take that, all right? I'll take Poland. Okay, that's where you draw the line. But that's fascinating, right? Like they were it, 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 that. I think is dead proof that Germany was not, you know, ready for war, right? Like yeah. if they thought, yeah. you know, Germany were ready to go, they they would have been like, yeah, if the French come at you, just deal with them and take the land. Like, what do we care? Um, well, and also within that broader context of like those those examples I just listed off, right? And if you look at Japan, so they have the invasion of Manchuria, then they invade the rest of China. <laughs> the western powers don't do anything then you have the yeah. spanish civil war again like lack of intervention we have to we have to consider the reality that the league of nations you know the predecessor to the un and you know nato and whatever else absolute failure in terms of actually sure. doing anything and stopping conflict and having that kind of you know global perspective on stopping conflict so mm-hmm. In many ways, if you look at Chamberlain's decision to appease Hitler, I can't necessarily blame him for doing it because it's kind of been the precedent that's set. But if I look at Hitler's decision to take the Sudetenland, I also kind of get it because he's lived through a series of events that pretty much tell him, like, chances are he's going to get what he wants. Because no one has the appetite to fight right now because mm-hmm. World War One is still it's still such an early memory, right? Like it's not in this this bygone era. Like it's still very familiar for very many people. Yeah, and I think like the Rhineland is a perfect starting point. It's like they're gonna let me do this. And I I think the piece of it, Italy invading Ethiopia, because like it's just such a it's like a sovereign nation getting invaded and then the king or the leader of Ethiopia, I can't remember what it was, basically goes to the League of Nations and like protests. And he's like, this is what you're here for. You need to stop Italy. And they're like, well, we'll put some sanctions, but it won't include oil. It won't include coal because we're worried that they're going to get closer to Germany and they might get mad and all these things. And so they essentially do nothing. 
And again, Hitler's sitting back and he's watching all of this stuff. And f- I think for Hitler's perspective, like just keep taking until, you know, you maybe overstep. And yeah, and it's exactly what happens. And I'm I'm curious for your thoughts on this, Richie. As I was kind of doing some reading, and a lot of people were kind of praising Chamberlain in a sense. I don't say a lot of people, but some people at least were saying, you know, he he bought time. That was his key thing, right? War with Germany was inevitable. What's a little bit of Czechoslovakia if it buys us, you know, another year to to rearm and, and get ready for wars? And I I thought about it a little bit. I'm curious for your thoughts. Is that like do you think that's a fair comment, or do you think that this did he really think that this this decision stopped? you know, the, the upcoming war with Germany. Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Um, okay. But what's the famous saying, right? I, we, we have peace in our time, right? Like right. that is the quote. So like when I think Chamberlain, I think appeasement, what I immediately go to is, you know, after the Munich agreement, we have peace in our time, the headlines across the papers, mm-hmm. Maybe Chamberlain's playing 4D chess and he's like, really, though? you know what I mean? Like, we're just buying ourselves time. Whereas I don't want to call it naivety, but, you know, I think for some reason, as maybe it's like Western democracy, Western influence, whatever it could be, there's a lot of emphasis on like signed documents between parties <laughs> um that like you know the western powers took as gospel like you know we have this signed document why would he lie well we know now in hindsight that like those treaties to some of those you know eastern european powers meant little to nothing Mm -hmm. during this time you know in, in in history so personally i i don't think so i don't think he was biding time. I think I think he was legitimately looking to establish peace and safety across Europe, which I think is still admirable. Like I don't I don't see that as a weakness. I think mm-hmm. he is living in the legacy of something that that's so horrible that he's trying to stop from happening again. Yeah, and I think I would agree with you on that too, right? Like as you mentioned, like Germany wasn't ready for war giving them another year, like they, they've gone from nothing. They were disarmed completely and had to start from scratch where at least the French and the British had something. They weren't, you know, sitting there with, with their pockets turned out. So, yeah, I think, and yeah, the peace in our time, it's just, it's too kind of perfect of a quote to say that, oh yeah, we're just buying time. So I, I, I would agree with you on that one, but I, I like kind of, as I'm, we're talking through it, I think like the decision itself was, there was precedent there. Like, I don't think it was totally wrong, like to give up a small piece of, of Czechoslovakia to, to save the Europe from another war. Like, I guess in his eyes kind of made sense. I don't think anybody really, nobody really, again, we're looking back at Hitler, right? We know who he is. We know the madman that he became and who he maybe always was. Nobody really knew that back then. Nobody knew that the scale that this guy was going to go through. Nobody knew that he was going to exterminate six million jews like nobody thought he was going to invade the soviet union and invade poland and take over huge chunks of europe like nobody saw that like even fathom that something like that was going to happen they just thought like you know yeah he wants he wants a little bit of you know his german-speaking people back which again in my head just ukraine and russia just still (laughs) keeps coming up as repeating itself of just oh yeah that's all they want and then oh he invades all of ukraine interesting um so yeah, I think I think that's a fair point on just I think history's maybe been tough on him on the sense of like being weak. I think maybe there's more criticism on the work that he didn't do before getting to this decision to really m- force Hitler's hand in a direction that he didn't want. Yeah, I think I think I, I agree with that sentiment. Yeah, I think history is funny that way. We can often, you know, create these anecdotes and kind of create black boxes around historical figures and decisions and put neat little, you know, bows on them to have easier to you know, not have the same type of complexity of analysis that's often required. It's very easy mm-hmm. to say, you know, Neville, Neville Chamberlain, poster boy for appeasement, peace in our time. What an idiot. How do you not yeah. see it happening? But, you know, doing the research, thinking about it, being a little bit more critical and being a little bit, you know, more empathetic. I can't blame him for making the decision. I don't know if I would have done anything different personally. Yeah, that's a, 
That's a good point, right? And I think we have to think back to, you know, the Churchill Chamberlain kind of relationship piece of like not saying bitter rivals, but definitely Churchill realizing that there's an opportunity for him to take power. Um, and I wonder too, like Churchill being the great war hero, essentially that he's seen um, throughout history, how kind of rallying around that grandioseness of, of Churchill and being the strong standing up to Hitler piece almost elevates him, but at the same time pushes Chamberlain down because he doesn't have that same level of, you know, punch and, and kind of toughness towards Hitler that, that, that Churchill had. And it'd be interesting, like if the roles were reversed, you know, what would have happened? And cause I think for Churchill, right? Like his hand was the, the war had already started. He just, again, just had to go win a war versus yeah. Chamberlain <laughs> had it. to play, had to play politics. Right. And then actually declare war and, and start thinking about how to actually go and win this thing. Well, on that point. So like it was, I think September 3rd, 1939, Great Britain officially, is at war with Germany. Historically speaking, um, you know, the historians aren't very kind uh, to our guy Chamberlain in the early stages <laughs> of World War II. His leadership is often characterized as being lackluster. You know, the early stages of World War II, um, I'm sure maybe some people have heard this kind of concept of the phony war where the French and British just kind of just waited it out, <laughs> waiting for the Germans to attack. Um, but to his credit, um, uh, something that, you know, I think a lot of people might not know about Chamberlain was that he was pretty influential in actually supporting the Royal Air Force and stopping Operation Sea Lion, which was the German uh, proposed invasion of Germany. Sorry, Germany's proposed invasion of Great Britain. And because Chamberlain kind of supported the investigation, experimentation and ultimately usage of radar, they were able to kind of stop and mitigate those German squadrons from getting in and attacking England very early on in, in, in the war. But ultimately, um, I think it was so, what was it? Yeah, May 1940, uh, Chamberlain resigned and Churchill came to power. He did continue to serve under Churchill um, for a few months, but on November 9th, he died of late stage bowel cancer. Wow. It kind of kind of makes you kind of sit back to these to these people who who serve their country until the day they die when I think I'm not sure how old he was there but I think he's probably well past the age of re retirement, right? Um but to work till, you know, up to the point where he's he's dying of a, a very painful type yeah. of cancer. I think I think he's about 70. Okay. Yeah. So again, he's he's working and especially back then too, right? Like it's you know, you're, you've lived through a long life serving your country. And, and I just kind of scrolling back up to, to some of the things you spoke about, like if Chamberlain was purely a peacetime prime minister, people might put him down as one of the greats, right? Like a lot of the things that he pushed to do. And I think that's, you can tell like, that's where his interests were. That's where his strengths were, but timing really just didn't work out for him no. in the way that it should have. And I think when you look at Chamberlain, like everyone focuses on this one decision, which probably wasn't the worst decision in the world. Maybe it would have been, you know, he kind of boxed himself into a corner and maybe you know, his foreign policy could have been better. But I think what he did for England with, you know, a lot of these acts and, and kind of work that he did as a minister of health, which kind of led to some of the, you know, socialized medicine that, that Britain, everybody in Britain experiences today. And um, I think like that part of the legacy sadly gets forgotten, which I think, arguably maybe had a, a bigger impact on on more people's lives you know generations to come and it will continue to have impact for generations to come where this one this is this sh decision as terrible as it was for that period of time um you know doesn't doesn't really have the impact that you know some of these great social movements that maybe he helped spearhead again i don't want to give him all the credit for it but yeah, yeah, yeah. i think i think there's I a level you. that this gets forgotten right and I think, sadly, that is kind of the enduring legacy. And I think I'd shared this with you before, but I'll re re repeat it for our listeners. It's actually a quote from Churchill to Chamberlain. And he says, you were given the choice of war and dishonor. You chose dishonor and you got war. Yeah, <laughs> that, that sounds like Churchill for you. And yeah, and yeah when, you, when you're a bitter rival, not bitter rival, but the guy you're going up against, the guy who's kind of coming 
coming for your job and who's disagreeing with you on a lot of political matters is Sir Winston Churchill. Yep. It makes It makes things tricky. So tough break, I think, for the legacy of Chamberlain, but I think history sh- should probably be more kinder to him. But ultimately, that's history for you, and we, we clue into some of those simpler things and things we can just point to to say this, you know, Ch- Chamberlain bad, Churchill good, wipe our hands of it and, and walk away. But that's just that's just the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, I think that would be like my last wrap, like thought to wrap it up would be essentially history is more than one decision in isolation in a vacuum. You have mm-hmm. to look at the context. You have to look at the precedent, the lead up to what he was doing and why he did it. And I think it's a much easier pill to swallow once you kind of have the context around it. Like, like most things for sure. And I think, I think that's the beauty of, of the, the kind of podcast that we're trying to build here is yeah, decisions are never made in a vacuum. There's a person behind it. There's a world behind it. There's people behind the scenes and it's just way more interesting when you really kind of take it outside of that vacuum. So I think that's a, a really good place to end. I think this was a, a really kind of interesting way for us to kind of shake things up a little bit. And I think this is a very interesting time and, I think we've learned about a few individuals here who who might be deserving of their own podcast at some point. In the oh yeah, hundred so, percent, <laughs> definitely awesome. All right, thanks, Richie. This was a good one, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Until next time, I'll see you next week. See you later. Thank you so much for listening to the History in Motion podcast. We appreciate your support. And if you're a fan of what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you next time.